Hello guys and welcome to episode 45 of the Beat Your Backlog podcast, a podcast discussing things gamers like to put off, get to another date, and oh yes, we'll definitely beat later, their backlog. I'm your host Adam and today we are exploring the Unova region in our quest to become the very best like no one ever was in Game Freaks and the Pokemon company's Pokemon White. The game was released alongside Pokemon Black all the way back in 2010 in Japan and made its way to Europe, North America and Australia in 2011. I can actually remember buying uh, Pokemon White when it was released. Uh, I was back then. I was in university and can remember actually going down to my local game shop. That was the name of the shop uh, that sold games uh, in Newcastle, where I studied for the midnight launch. I don't remember why. Like I kind of, I remember that I had played Diamond and Pearl and wasn't that impressed with it, and had kind of fallen off Pokemon since then. But for whatever reason, I was like, okay, I want to buy this new one because it just looked interesting, I guess. I, I think the concept of black and white was really cool and also the box art, but it was very simplistic. You had like a white Pokemon on a black background or a black Pokemon on a white background. Obviously, it has a lot, very good contrast, very striking and very cool. And I remember going down there and having to line up for a little bit to get my version of Pokemon White. And what was funny was that if you went to the midnight launch, you also got like a free Nintendo DS case with Zekrom and Reshiram, uh, Reshiram on the front of it, which I think I still have today. And I think it still has my original black DS Lite in it back in England. And um, unfortunately, I never actually kept my original copy of Pokemon White. I'm pre pretty sure I sold it just before moving to Austria, which is, was about the time when I think the prices started to get really high. Like, I remember selling it for around, like, £40 back then and thinking, ah, oh, you know, I've got a steal here for this old Pokemon game. However, back when I bought it in 2011, I do remember absolutely devouring the game whilst my girlfriend at the time watched Keeping Up With The Kardashians on the sofa. So she would watch her TV shows and I would play Pokemon. And I was really impressed with the visual upgrades that had been made since Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. But since then, I hadn't really thought that much about the game. Uh, that was until recently uh, when, if you're a regular listener, you'll know um, that I recently released, uh, so, sorry, recently reviewed Pokemon Scarlet and I crowned it as my personal best Pokemon game ever. And I actually put up on YouTube a quick review, which is usually when, when I do a summary for the podcast, I'll break that out and put that on YouTube as like a means to try and get new people into the videos. And I put that quick review up. And basically, to summarize it, I, I said, yeah, exactly that. that I thought um, Scarlet was the best Pokemon game ever, even though it has a lot of visual bugs and issues. I still thought the story was the best. I still thought the, the actual catching of the Pokemon feels the best in that game. And putting the the, uh, the review up on YouTube, surprise, surprise, I, actually, I got quite a lot of pushback from Pokemon, how should we say, uh, sort of uh, enthusiasts. Um, saying that I know actually I was wrong and Pokemon White was a better game because it has a better story. So around then I started to scour secondhand game insights and kind of secondhand marketplaces until I managed to find a copy of the game that didn't make my wallet cry. So I actually got it for a good price uh, because Black and White and also Black and White 2 are quite expensive. And uh, yeah, I managed to find one that was decently priced. And 30 hours later, after beating the story, I have made up my mind on which game I think is better. Before, without further ado, let's get into the review of Pokemon White. And is it just nostalgia talking or is it as good as everyone says and remembers? Let's find out in this week's episode of the Beat Your Backlog podcast. But as always, before we do, let me please remind you to follow, subscribe and review the podcast with five stars wherever you're listening. Now let's get into the show. <laughs> Before we kind of get into the story, because that was like the main theme of this review, of is this sort of black and white story and, and if it's as good as Scarlet's, I do want to give some context for when black and white uh, released and another kind of reason why I think they're so fondly remembered. I think it could be argued that these games were uh, actually like a soft relaunch for the Pokemon series uh, because they're the first game since Generation 1 to only have completely new Pokemon in it from the very beginning. So Generation 2, Generation 3, they all had some Pokemons from previous generations in them, also Generation 4. But this was the first one where they said they went out and they said, OK, we're starting with completely new Pokemon. That means there are no fan favorites like Pikachu and Charizard. And I think that factor instantly just makes the game feel uh, unique when it's compared to its predecessors. 
And when I asked about his decision to only include 150 plus new species of Pokemon from the start of the game, the game's director, Junichi Masuda, stated that this uh, he did this so all players would not be able to know what Pokemon is a good one to use, and it would level the playing ground for new players. And honestly, I'm not sure if, if the strategy was to level the playing field for new players, or was it to try and reinvigorate the Pokemon IP, which I think was kind of at its a low point back uh, at this time. Uh, but either way, I think it worked, because the game is still remembered as one of the best in the series, and the 150 plus new Pokemon have some amazing designs, most of which I had forgotten debuted in, in Gen 5. So just to name a few of the Pokemon, uh, the really iconic Pokemon and ones that look fantastic uh, that debuted in Pokemon Black and White, we have sort of Tepig lines. So there's Tepig, Pignite and Ember. There is Muna and Mushana. They're like the big kind of like floating cow uh, moon Pokemon. There is Venipede, Whirlipede and Scolipede. They're the ones that look like uh, Millipedes and Centipedes. Sandal, uh, Korok Korok, <laughs> it's a hard word to say, and Crocodile. They're the kind of uh, sand crocodile um Pokemon that is Koffer Grigus, which is the ghost uh, coughing, like Egyptian coughing Pokemon. So Zorua and Zororak, they're the the dark like fox looking Pokemon with the red hair. So Lotus, Duo, Duosian, and Reunculus. So they're the ones that look like cells that then split, and eventually it kind of has like a little weird. <laughs> uh, so what's he called? Reunculus. I can't say or Reunculus, something like that can't say his name very well, but he has like these weird little arms and, and skeleton inside him. Then you have, you know, the dragon Pokemon for the game. You have Axu, Frax uh, Fr uh, Fracture and ha Haxorus. Then there is Ponyard and Bishop, who I think are fantastic looking Pokemon. And finally, you also have another iconic dragon. You have uh, Dino, Zwilus and High. Dragon, which is also very cool. And creating 150 plus new Pokemons is something that I think is quite like a ballsy move and maybe a, a move that they had to do out of necessity to kind of rejuvenate the, the series or the franchise. And it's definitely something that modern day Game Freak would never do, even though I would like them to do it and have like a fresh kind of restart. Um, yeah, they'd never do it because they already get screamed at if all 1,025 Pokemon are not in their newest game. And they also still usually use Pikachu, Eevee and the free starters from Gen 1. Uh, as like kind of front and center of their marketing. If anyone's played um, the Pokemon trading card game Pocket, you'll know that exactly is the same. That Charizard is there, Mewtwo is there, Pikachu is there. The three, the other two starters are all there, so they still use them. So it was quite interesting that they didn't do this for Gen Five. And also, I think it shows in Pokemon Scarlet because when you play through it, there are lots and lots of Gen Five Pokemon in that game, which I think just goes to show how good their designs are and how much they still resonate with fans. And it wasn't just like the, the new 150 um, plus Pokemon that really sets black and white apart um, because Gen 5 is also famous for adding the uh, IVs and EVs into the Pokemon series too. So now I'm not really going to pretend that I'm uh, much of a Pokemon breeder or a competitive player. So uh, yeah, I won't pretend that I know that much about IVs and EVs. However, I do sort of understand how important they are to the two scenes in the Pokemon uh, fandom because, you know, it's very important in competitively to breed Pokemon with great IVs and EVs. Um, and therefore, I think this is like that it, it is a mechanic because Pokemon games always add new mechanics in or new tweaks in, but most of them don't stick around. So I think this is like another um, feather in the cap for Gen 5 because the IVs and EVs have stuck around and they've also kind of populated into other Pokemon games like uh, I think now in Pokemon Go there's also like IV and EV training and uh, yeah they still have a, a great importance and relevance in Pokemon history. And speaking of history let's now move on to the lore of Unova and the game's story. So the story of Pokemon White starts off as any other Pokemon game. You play as a young trainer about to set off on their Pokemon adventure and are joined by two friends, Sharon, a kind of busybody who is intent on becoming the strongest Pokemon trainer in the world, and Brianna, a clumsy but endearing girl who is trying to find her way in the world. The three of you are given your first Pokemon by Professor Juniper. The Pokemon you can choose from are Tepig, which is the fire Pokemon, uh, the fire pig Pokemon, and, and Oshawott, uh, a water otter Pokemon, and Snivy, the grass snake kind of reptile thing Pokemon. And against my better judgment, I decided to go with Snivy, which meant Sharon ended up with Tepig and Bianca got Oshawott. And yeah, I kind of regretted sn sn Snivy straight away. I think the first time I played the game, I actually went with Tepig, which I still think is the better choice. It's like the, the coolest looking uh, starter Pokemon and also has the best kind of designs throughout its entire evolution line. Um, 
But yeah, for some reason, I, went, I decided to go with Snivy. I don't think it's a very good Pokemon. I don't think it has very good moves either. Um, and it was always kind of my, my least favorite Pokemon throughout the game. I, I have to say, I think it was the only time I've ever considered actually swapping out uh, my starter Pokemon for another Pokemon with the same same uh, type. Because I really like the um, the dealing uh, Pokemon that you get in this the, quite early on in this game. I think it's yeah, it's, it's such a cooler design. But anyway, after absolutely destroying both Birana and uh, Sharon in a battle and embarrassing them in front of Pro Professor Juniper, I was off on my way to beat the eight gym leaders of Unova and become the Pokemon Master. And like all Pokemon games, the hours pretty much go, go past the same, or at least the early hours go past the same. You fight your way to the first gym, uh, which in this case is in Striaton City and is run by the triplets Killian, Chili and Cress. And depending on the Pokemon, like so your, your starter Pokemon that you picked, um, you will fight whichever of the brothers you were weakest against. So uh, in my case, I went up against Chili, who is a fire type trainer. Uh, but the game basically gives you a cheat code because you get a Pan Paw or, or a Pan, what they call it? I always forget the name, Pan Paw, Pan Sage and Pan, uh, Pan Sage, Pan Paw, Pan Sia, something like that. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what the, third, the fire one is called. But yeah, the game basically gives you one of these that is also, that is strong against the, 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 the gym leader you're going to, to fight against. So I got my Panpaw, which is a water type. And uh, yeah, like I said, wipe the floor with Chili. And uh, as you progress through the gyms, the story starts to get up to its usual Pokemon tricks with the introduction of Team Plasma, a group of troublemakers led by the Sinister Getis who want to liberate Pokemon from being servants of humans. So when you first meet them, Team Plasma actually kind of seem sort of rational. They are put. They are kind of appealing to people's uh, goodness and uh, want them to freely let their Pokemon loose. Um, however, this soon turns into them stealing trainers' Pokemons to use against them. Uh, this happens to. Uh, did I say her name was Brianna or Brianka? I can't remember. I need to Google that. Hang on. So yes, I think I was calling her. Bianca before her name is Bianca sorry um, but yeah uh, this actually then happens to to Bianca um, who uh, has her Pokemon Muna stolen from her by Team Plasma and sort of ever as the hero you set out and try to get the Pokemon back and it's around this time that a mysterious character called N is introduced to you he has some links to Team Plasma and um, but you're not really sure how in, actually at this point how involved he is in Team Plasma. Uh, but he does put you through some a series of tests, which is mostly just a Pokemon a Pokemon battle, which you have to beat him in um, to see how strong your friendship link is between you and your Pokemon. And interestingly, he can test the friendship of your Pokemon by talking to them and actually asking them how much he, uh, they they like you because he can actually understand what Pokemon say, which we'll get onto more later. And as you journey through and over, you keep bumping into N, who progressively sees himself sees himself as a profited hero that will recreate the world in two separate worlds for humans and Pokemon. So again, it kind of goes on this theme of Team Plasma that they want to split uh, Pokemon from being like the slaves of humans and that are only used to basically benefit humans and that they should have their own place in the world. And N also wants this and wants to create a separate world for Pokemon that is separate from humans. And his plan uh, to do this, he uh, wants to use something, uh, so an ancient relic called the Lightstone to resurrect the fabled dragon slash fire type Pokemon or legendary fire type Pokemon, uh, Reshiram. Um, he'll then take the legendary dragon to the Pokemon League to beat the champion Alder. Then and only then will he have the influence and the power to convince and or force people to free their Pokemon and create a new world order. order. However, there is one way to stop him. Uh, in your journey, you actually find the Dark Stone, which is the counterpart to the Light Stone, which you can use to resurrect the other legendary dragon, uh, uh, a dragon electric type called Zekrom, who is uh, on the cover of Pokemon White. Uh, because luckily, you are the second profited hero of Anova's past, and thank goodness for that, because yeah, otherwise you'd have no chance against N, even though you beat him in every single fight you have up until that point. Uh, once you have your shiny new legendary, you follow N to the Pokemon League. After beating the Elite Four, who at this point are purposefully easy to beat so that you can finish the story, you arrive in the Champion's Chamber just after N has defeated Alder. N challenges you to, to battle him and show once and for all that he is the foretold hero. However, after you beat him, it is quickly revealed that the leader of Team Plasma, Getis, never really thought N was the hero. He had been using N as a puppet to try and convince people to free their Pokemon for the Pokemon's good. However, what Getis really wanted was for Team Plasma to enslave the freed Pokemon so they could use them to keep their control over Unova. 
Once you then beat Getis, N realizes that his dream was just a lie and takes off with Re on Reshiram. And this is more or less where the credits roll and you restart the game in your bedroom at your mum's house where you are introduced to a police inspector. I can't remember his name, but I think he appears in Diamond and Pearl 2, um, who wants you to find Getis' uh, sages. Uh, who are basically like the lieutenants um, that help him rule Team Plasma. I think there's seven of them, I think. I'm not, I can't remember. I think it was the seven sages, but maybe I'm misremembering that. Maybe there's less. Uh, plus, the inspector tells you that the roads to the eastern side of Anova, which were previously blocked, are now open, and you can travel freely there to look for the sages. And uh, so, talking about like the story, I think like around like 75% of this story is pretty much the same as any other Pokemon story. Basically, to summarize it, there is a group of bad guys that wanted to take over the world for reasons and more or less steal people's Pokemon to do it. And you are the hero of the story, you have to stop them. However, I must say that I do think the final 25% of Pokemon White story is very, very good. Firstly, I love how involved the gym leaders are in the narrative throughout the game. So um, when you first get to a gym, they, they usually give you some kind of mission to do uh, before you're allowed to challenge them, which is mostly just finding Team Plasma in the town where the where the gym is and beating them. And I like this because it gives you a bit of like a, an overview of the of the gym leader's character. And I think they're quite interesting too. Like there is one uh, who she's like the curator of a museum. There's a guy who's kind of like a mining uh, kind of cowboy. There's one who's a very kind of eccentric um, ice type trainer. And obviously, I can't remember their names, uh, but you, you'll you know who they are if you've played the game. And um, yeah, I think it's like, nevertheless, it's, it's very cool to see how the gym leaders interact with each other in this game. So they are very much part of the main story. Um, they kind of know each other and they have history together, which I think is really cool because it would make sense that they do because they are all peers in this Pokemon world. And I can't really remember any other Pokemon game in the series until Black and White where the gym leaders really actually interact with each other. They usually just stand in their gyms waiting for you to challenge them. So it's kind of nice that it fleshes out the world of Unova, uh, seeing the gym leaders interact, seeing them be part of the story. And a lot of it makes sense that if something is happening in this region that all uh, to do with Pokemon, all of the, the, the big, you know, the eight gym leaders would come together to try and solve the problem. So I thought that was really cool. Um, in addition, I thought the, uh, the Pokemon champion Alda was a really interesting character. So his story is he's basically like a disillusioned champion who has been wandering the world of Anova, uh, looking for a purpose after his par partner Pokemon died of illness. Um, and it's almost basically seems like he is depressed and can only be roused to return to the Pokemon League after N challenges him. So it's kind of like, you know, this ultimatum that he has to go back and de defeat N to kind of save the world. And then he never, he actually doesn't manage to do that. And then you have to do it for him. And I think, yeah, his kind of the subplot um, of, of, of Alda has some kind of compelling themes to it that I really did not expect from a Pokemon game, which was released in 2011. Uh, furthermore, I liked that there was like uh, some exposition around N and why he joined Team Plasma. Um, so again, like N's plan is to use the legendary dragons to create separate worlds for humans and Pokemon. And he his reasoning for this is that be, uh, is that he he grew up as an orphan in the woods with a group of mistreated and outcast Pokemon. And because he spent so much time with his Pokemon, N managed to be able to understand their language and communicate with them. And they kind of told him their horror stories of how they were mistreated by humans. Um, and when Getis then finds uh, N and adopts him, he purposely surrounds him with other Pokemon that have been mistreated by humans in an attempt to warp N's worldview and convincing that Teen's Plasma's plans are just and fair. And again, it's it's this is like a very Pokemon story. Don't get me wrong; like it's it's not like I'm like oh my god, this is like Shakespeare or something or Tolkien. It's 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 a very Pokemon story. But again, it's not it's not really something that I was expecting in a Pokemon game because. It did actually make me feel bad for N that he is kind of tricked and like he has this vision of the world when he, he has been told he is sort of like the Jesus of the world more or less. And then it turns out that everyone's been lying to him and he's not who he thinks he is. And it's kind of interesting that then he he, he goes away at the end of the story and it's kind of left open what happens with him next. And it, it was nice to have like a kind of bad guy or a central like, um, uh, not protagonist, what's the opposite called? Antagonist, who 
you were given a reason for why he's bad, like why he, or, or, he, or maybe he doesn't actually think he's bad, but you understand why he thinks like this. So it's kind of a bit like uh, Thanos, that you kind of reason why he's he's a bad guy, but you're like, actually, he makes sense. And N kind of also does that too. So I'm actually looking forward to finding out what happens to N in Pokemon White 2, because I did manage to pick up Pokemon White 2 as well. So hopefully we find out more there. And finally, the lore behind the two legendaries was pretty good too. Um, now, to be honest, I think lore behind Pokemon Legendaries is usually quite good in, in the games. Um, when you think of like the stories of Mewtwo, Mew, Ho-Ho, Lugia, Groundon, and Kyroga, uh, they all have great lore, and obviously like a lot of the Pokemon movies are based around the lore of these Legendaries. Uh, however, there is something cool about uh, this game, that, that, that basically the two Dragon-type Legendaries were once one dragon, um, that kind of exist yeah they existed as one dragon and then when the, t the two heroes of history kind of went to war with each other the two dragons split and sided with one of the, i think they're actually brothers the heroes sided with one brother each and since then they've kind of been at like odds and ends and kind of like yin and yang from each other ever since and i just like with in the story i'm excited to find out more about these legendary beasts in the next game but the question remains, is this game better, or is this story better than Pokemon Scarlet's? And before we get on to that, I would like to remind you again that if you're enjoying the episode so far, please make sure you give us a like or a subscription, or you follow us wherever you're listening, and please leave us a five-star review if you're listening on podcast services. Now, let's get on to if it is better than Pokemon Scarlet's story. So yeah, the question remains, is it better than Scarlet? And since you know my entire YouTube comments told me that I was completely wrong for thinking Scarlet's were better... Well, uh, in my opinion, I still prefer Pokemon Scarlet Story because I think the three storylines add so much more needed freshness to the Pokemon series. Uh, I like the twist of the bad guys not really being bad guys uh, in this Team Star subplot. Furthermore, I like the craziness and complete out of left fieldness of Arvin's storyline, where his mother is a scientist that is killed and cloned by an AI, which wants to open a portal to the past in Scarlet, at least in, in Violet. It's his dad who opens a portal to the future, and like these, these futuristic or prehistoric pokemon are coming through the portal i think that's very cool i will admit that the victory royal uh, sorry the victory road plot is pretty bad in scarlet um, and is way more interesting in white uh, the elite four trainer designs are much cooler in white too um, i really like that uh, so like chantal uh, is a ghost type trainer and they i'm not sure if it's a guy or a girl but they are in a haunted mansion and marshall a fighting type trainer is in like a ufc kind of octagon cage uh, and these uh, sort of like nice details that made those trainers much more interesting, unlike the Elite Four in Pokemon Scarlet, where they were just very generic, um, just characters that were there. Even this, the setting of the Elite Four, which, or the, the Pokemon League in general, is just in a white room, like as if you're in like an office block. I thought it was really, really bad, and it was really, really disappointing. And the characters, yeah, just completely forgetful, apart from Larry, but that's only because you, he was one of the gym leaders that you fought too. Nevertheless, most of the story in Pokemon White is more of the same of what we had in uh, in other Pokemon games until this game was released. Basically, like we've already talked about, uh, Evil Team wants to take over the world and are steal Pokemon because some sort of random reason. Uh, Pokemon White story does go a bit further, like a bit beyond this with interesting fleshed out characters and cool lore. But I don't feel like it is as fresh as P Pokemon Scarlet's was. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I think Pokemon uh, White story is bad in any way. I already forked out a fortune to buy Pokemon White 2 because I want to know what happens next. I just don't think it is as good as many other Pokemon fans seem to think too. And yeah, like I said, I think just that Scarlet it did feel so new and so different with you being able to choose which kind of storyline you wanted to do at whatever your own pace that just made it way more kind of open and, and more interesting to me than these kind of more linear stories that pokemon has always had up until then so yeah so the what we've kind of talked about the story we've talked about the sort of context of pokemon white let's talk about the actual gameplay and the gameplay in pokemon white is is exactly what you would expect it to be from a mainline pokemon game uh, you train a party of six pokemon by winning turn based battles to gain experience points and level up your mons for those interested my party consisted of a superior a swanna a damantian a crocodile uh, re Unkilus, or however you say that and until i got zekrom i also had a galvantula um, after playing scarlet recently i did feel that leveling up in white was very very slow uh, obviously this is because in the newer games you have shared xp so whenever you beat a, 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 a an enemy or a pokemon uh, all of your pokemon in your party get a share of the xp whereas in this game uh, in white and up until i think it was up until sword and shield i think 
or maybe Sun and Moon, but I think Sword and Shield, it was always that whoever, you know, whichever Pokemon took kind of part in the battle, they would get a share of the XP. And it was funny because whilst I was playing Scarlet, I did actually have some nostalgia for this like olden days way, way of, of growing your Pokemon. Um, because yeah, all you would really have is an XP share and you would always have to swap in and out the first Pokemon of your party to, to, get, it, uh, to get it to level up and to get it to get experience points. Now, however, after playing the game for 30 hours, I can't really ever imagine going back to, the, how, the, to, to how the system was before because it just feels so grindy. And because of this kind of grindiness uh, feeling and the kind of the, the slow progress of actually leveling up your Pokemon, uh, I did not do that much in, in, in the end of game content. So again, like most Pokemon games, kind of finishing the story isn't necessarily finishing the game. Uh, because after you defeat Team Plasma, uh, you unlock the eastern side of Unova and there you can find three new towns to explore. And in this area, the Pokemon are significantly harder, which makes leveling up a little bit easier because I think the Pokemon on average are about like in the 60s but it's weird because there is there is lots of different pokemon at different stages of their evolutionary chain so you might come up against like a Ralts that's level 63 and you kill it and you get like 100 xp or you might come up across like a, a gyarados at level 60 and get 2000 xp it's very kind of weird and inconsistent um but yeah i i like i said before i sort of ended up or maybe i didn't say before but i ended up beating the game at around level 50 and when you beat the game you aren't technically the pokemon champion because you never battled it out with adler because you go on to beat n and then finish the story um now however the the elite four is way more difficult than it was in the story because in the story they're purposefully easy so everyone can beat them um originally in the they had four pokemon each and each kind of had levels around level 40 now they all have six pokemon with them all being in levels around 75 and since i already thought the leveling system was quite slow i wasn't really motivated to go back and grind all six of my pokemon up by 25 levels therefore i never actually became the pokemon champion that doesn't mean that i won't ever go back to the game like i, I kind of feel like this is like a perfect game where i'm kind of between games or maybe uh, coming up uh, i want to play temtem swarm which is on my pc and my pc is in my or my laptop my is in my office and when i'm kind of like oh, i don't really want to sit at my desk and play i'd rather play something on the on the sofa maybe i'll just load up pokemon white and just keep grinding uh pokemon levels uh if i don't feel like sitting on the pc so it might be a game like that although i did say that about pokemon scarlet 2 and since finishing it i've never been back to it <laughs> so let's see um, I did, however, find a couple of the Team Pla Plasma Sages and got my ass kicked by Cynthia, who is the Pokemon champion from Diamond and Pearl, who is holidaying in one of the eastern towns of Anova. Um, and yeah, going on then to kind of how the game looks and its presentation, even though I don't think the story is as good, good as Pokemon Scarlet, I do think Pokemon White is by far the best looking Pokemon game ever. I love the pixel art era of Pokemon and black and white is the pinnacle of the art direction. Um, I can remember being amazed when first playing the game back in 2011 that the Pokemon had idle animations during the battle and that the camera kind of dynamically moves um, from Pokemon to Pokemon when they attack uh, because the movement makes the battles feel way more fluid and like they are kind of going backward, back and forth like they're taking turns and attacking whereas before this it was very much just like kind of static sprites that would have like attack animations but that was it. It's also cool that the game kind of experiments with mixed 2D pixel art assets and also kind of 3D pixel art assets um, because, yeah, it's mostly noticeable with the bridges in the game because there are a lot of impressive looking 3D bridges that the game makes you go over. And I think it's cool because it adds like an, an aspect of size and awe to an over, uh, which you don't really see in any of the, the games previously. Um, however, the mixture of styles is best pulled off in the game's cutscenes. So yeah, there are cutscenes in the game, which is also awesome. Uh, I think they're masterfully crafted. They uh, use both screens of the DS to show off every pr uh, show off the very pretty artwork, and I especially like the cutscenes where N revives Reshiram uh, because the dragon, so the Pokemon Reshiram is is. Uh, he's rendered in 3d but everything else is in 2d so it almost has like a parallax effect which is really cool and it just makes um makes restroom just feel huge and powerful which it should because it's a legendary pokemon and it's so cool to see in a pokemon game from 2011 on the nintendo ds so like how they went hard for it now and it's even more so um like in like um, cool to see that they did this back in the day because 
you know, there are so many notorious bad cutscenes from Pokemon Scarlet and Violet with like the, them going into the classroom and faces not really animating, um, animations running at like five frames per second, like just loads of weird janky, jankiness that they do in the cutscenes. Like the cutscenes in the most recent game aren't like made, you know, they're, they're made with like in-game like in -game assets and they just move them around kind of thing. They aren't actually like, they're not, they're not cinematic. And in this game, they feel way more cinematic, which is really, really cool. Furthermore, that, that is kind of elevated by the soundtrack to the game because it is it's awesome. Um, I'm writing this review, or did, I'm recording this podcast, I should say, around the time when uh, Nintendo Music launched, so the new app that's like Nintendo's version of Spotify. And every day I'm hoping it'll add the Pokemon White soundtrack to it because I would listen to it nonstop. And it, it is kind of a meme because of, uh, you know, I think it was on TikTok. But the track from Driftvale City is a banger and I could listen to it on loop all day. It's just so good. So like upbeat and happy sounding and yeah, just just really nice to listen to. And I also think like the staple like battle music and Pokemon Center music in this game are fantastic too. That's not always the case. Sometimes they can go a little bit too far with, with those tracks because, you know, they're the ones that players mostly recognize because they're in most of the games or variations of them are in most of the games. But in, in Pokemon White and Black, I think they sound great. And yeah, in general, the music is just a cherry on top of the gorgeous, well-polished game that is a joy to look at and to listen to. And it's kind of going to be interesting too because I expect the next Pokemon remakes to be black and white because obviously it makes sense because the last ones they did were Brilliant Diamond and Sparkling Pearl or whichever way, whichever way around that goes. Um, and my hope is great Game Freak does them in a 2D HD style uh, that the Dragon Quest 3 remake recently got remade into because I, I, I want to see the stunning pixel art of black and white elevated to that level with some nice lighting, some nice particle effects, uh, some kind of depth of field. I think that would be awesome. I really hope they do something like that for Pokemon, even if it's like a Pokemon kind of spin-off game. Like I'd love for them to make, instead of doing like another a, a big mainline game, be like, all right, this is like, it's a mainline game, but it's a much smaller scope. Kind of how um, Assassin's Creed did Assassin's Creed Mirage, where they were like, oh, this is more like a nod to the original Assassin's Creed games. It's only like 12 hours long. The scope is way less in, than uh, for Valhalla and for Shadows, I think the new one's called. I'd love for them to do a Pokemon game like that, where it's like, this is like based off of the originals, like it's for the old school players. It's still in a pixel art, art style, but it's been like modernized. I think that would be awesome. And that kind of then comes to the question because I was I was asking this myself before starting playing the game because of how everyone's kind of reaction was in, in my YouTube comments. Is Pokemon White overrated? And the short answer is no. Pokemon White is one of the best Pokemon games the series has ever had. It is a gorgeous game. We introduced over 150 new Pokemon to the franchise, many of which are still fan favorites to this day. In addition, the game introduces Pokemon series staples, IVs and EVs, which are still a huge part of the Pokemon breeding and competitive scene. The story is great, though much of it is generic and could fit into any Pokemon game, the parts that aren't are very good. The lore behind the legendary dragons is excellent and the interaction and involvement of the game's gym leaders in the events of the plots make the Unova region a much more interesting place than other Pokemon regions. Furthermore, N and Alda's backstories touch on themes that you would not expect from a Pokemon game from 2011 and for that matter from 2024 either. All of this together made me excited enough to scour the internet in the search of a copy of Pokemon White 2 to see where the story takes me and these characters. Though the story is great, I still think Pokemon Scarlet's story is a little bit more engaging. I like the three different plot lines and felt like the game went out of its way to be more different from anything that came before it. However, what I will say is that Pokemon White is by far the better looking game. Almost 15 years after release, the game still looks and sounds stunning and the use of 2D and 3D pixel art in the game's cutscenes looks awesome, even on the Nintendo DS's low res screens. I can't wait to see how Game Freak plans to remake the game in the future. Hopefully it's in the HD 2D style of the recent Dragon Quest 3 remake. And yeah, guys, that was my thoughts on, on Pokemon White. I think in general, I would say it may be, is a better Pokemon experience than Pokemon Scarlet. Um, because that, I don't know, it's, it's a hard one. I think Pokemon Scarlet had so many issues with it, where this game is just such, and it was so, like, it was such a big step forward for Pokemon in the sense of, like, the, the design and how the world works. And I still think it's way, 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 by, like, like by far the best actual game of catching Pokemon. Like, that, that game had me, like, invigorated in catching Pokemon like I've never felt in any other game before it. 
I love the openness. I love the kind of, you can go anywhere. I don't think that they actually like really nailed it. Like there was still a lot of things of, you, you know, fighting gym battles where you had Pokemon 40 levels over the, the, the gym leaders Pokemon. I think they could have done that better. Whereas Pokemon White is, yeah, it's a much a smaller experience. It like has a very interesting story. Like, I don't think, um, I don't know. It's hard to say which is the better game. Like, I still think, oh, it's hard. I, I still think Pokemon Scarlet is the better game, even without, or, or even with all of its kind of, like, uh, messiness and, and lagginess and everything like that. But Pokemon White is, like, a great package experience of a Pokemon game. It has a good story, beautiful artwork, really great Pokemon designs, great music. Um, it's, like... I don't, I don't know how to say it, but it just feels very complete. Like, it's a complete experience. And I think out of all of the other Pokemon games before Scarlet, this one is by far the best. But I still think Scarlet is slightly better. But yeah, guys, that was episode 45 of the Beat Your Backlog podcast. I would love to know what you think of Pokemon White and where do you rate it on your list of, or your tier list of Pokemon games. If you're a Spotify listener, you can let me know by commenting on the episode. And if you're listening elsewhere, let me know on social media by adding me at bybpodcast.com bsky.social on blue skies or just search if you're on blue sky search for byb podcast or you can look me up on instagram byb underscore podcast or if you're a discord person you can also join the discord and um, the link is in the description and yeah just remember i've talked about it a lot during this episode but if you're interested in, uh, or in the mood to listen to more content about pokemon make sure you check out episode 38 of the of the podcast about pokemon scarlet and why i still think it's the best pokemon game ever and before you go, guys, let me just remind you, Beat Your Backlog is a newish podcast and needs your support. So if you've enjoyed the episode, please consider subscribing and or following wherever you're listening and leaving us a five-star review because reviews help new people find the podcast. So it would be wonderful if you could leave us one. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.